Welcome, friends, to another speaker's night of the KCL Turkish Society. Today, uh, we are in the company of Mustafa Qureshi, who is a distinguished researcher uh, specializing in Islamic history in Cyprus. In 2008, he established the historical association Jezire Darneye, uh, and his extensive research spans across the national archives of northern Cyprus, Turkey, and the Q archives in the United Kingdom. Additionally, he has served as a historical advisor to the Council of Turkish Cypriot Associations, with numerous contributions to the field of Islamic and Turkish history in Cyprus. Mustafa has presented numerous seminars, authored articles, and conducted extensive field research on both sides of the island. He has been frequently invited to television channels and online platforms in North Cy Northern Cyprus and the UK and hosts his own historical show, Geçmişi Keşvet, on the Northern Cyprus channel, Kanal T. Today he joins us to enlighten us with his research on the Ottoman conquest of Cyprus, focusing particularly on insights gleaned from Ottoman and Venetian sources. Now I yield the floor to Mustafa. All right, good evening, everybody. Should I, should I group today? OK, before I get started, I just want to ask, just as a, a warm up, if anybody knows anything about the conquest of Cyprus? Has anybody heard perhaps any myths to do with the conquest of Cyprus? Anything at all? No? OK. I should ask you, you say much. Yeah. Any myths that come to mind regarding the, the motivation regarding the conquest of the island? Yeah, that's a very popular one. Yeah. That's right. Did everybody catch that? So one of the popular myths that's out there is that Sultan Selim II was so fond of Cypriot wine that rather than making the purchases, he didn't have enough money, perhaps, I don't know what it was, um, but he had to go through all the effort and struggle to conquer Cyprus so we get hold of that Cypriot wine. So that is one of them. Thank you. Anyone else have any other? Okay. <laughs> I won't repeat the last part. Uh, but certainly the name Cyprus derives, Kypros in Greek, derives from the word, uh, well, copper derives from Kypros. So there was a, an abundance of, of, of copper. Um, I don't know whether that's uh, one of the reasons, though, but interesting take. So there is another myth that goes around, and unfortunately it's rather common with uh, even kind of somewhat historical sources, one of which says that there was a Jewish person, there's always a Jew involved in these stories, right, um, called Yasef Nasi, and he was a friend of the Sultan, and they were such good friends that apparently... In one conversation, Sultan Selim said, if I conquer Cyprus, I'm going to make you the king of the island. And these kind of things have been repeated throughout history. And unfortunately, particularly in, in the last hundred years or so, where we, most of us don't have access to Ottoman records because of the change in the, in, the, in the script that we've had, we're not able to distinguish what's true and what's myth. There's so many people that even when I go to Cyprus, they say, ah, oh, Sultan Selim, Ishki Selim, he loves to drink wine. But it just doesn't make sense. Somebody in this position uh, to go through all that effort, he had all the money under in his disposal. So why would he go through all of that effort? There's also another myth that uh, comes about. This to do more with the end of the conquest uh, regarding the Venetian commander Marco Antonio Bragadin and how supposedly they had an, a, a peace treaty with Lala Mustafa Pasha and how Lala Mustafa Pasha broke this treaty. Um, and I'll be expanding on that towards the end of the presentation. Okay, so before we actually get on to it, what, were the, what was the, the geo, geopolitical situation, the history behind Cyprus that's relevant to the Ottoman conquest? Well, actually, we can go back all the way back to 648 to 965, uh, where there was an Arab-Byzantine condominium. So condominium means a, a power-sharing agreement, which is very rare 
in history. Um, but if we think back to certainly the first hundred years um, of the spread of the Islamic Empire, the Caliphate, going from all the way from Al-Andalus and Spain all the way to Sindh in, in South Asia and China, Cyprus was shared by these two powers. Now the details of which we're not exactly sure about. It could be that there was a physical divide in the island, much like there is today. Um, although this time, the, the, the power of the Muslims was in the south, certainly around Paphos. Unlike it is now where the, the Turks and Muslims are on the northern side of the island. After 965, with the reconquest from uh, Emperor Focus of, of the Byzantine Empire, uh, we can fast forward on to 1426 when the Mamluks of Egypt and Syria, all the way up to uh, places in Anatolia, um, like Elbistan, for example, were all under this Mamluk control. And they actually, in 1426, by Sultan Barspai, took the suzerainty of the island but allowed for the Latins, who were ruling the island at the time, not the Greek Cypriots, mind you, allowed them to govern the island, to administer it, and in one source, in fact, it, the king himself says to the sultan that I am your wali, I am your, your governor. So he was governing on behalf of the Mamluks. Why this is significant? Unlike with the, the Arab Byzantine condominium, where the link is a spiritual connection, a Muslim element, with the Byzantine, with the Mamluks rather, it develops beyond the spiritual aspect of being uh, a spiritual bond to being also an ethnic bond because the Mamluks themselves were Turks. The ruling class were Turkish people. And Mamluk in Arabic means slave. So that wasn't the name of their state. No one's going to call themselves the slave state or slave empire. Right? The name of the empire was actually Ad-Dawla Turkiya. Turkiya Devleti, the Turkish state. And the kings were known in the Arabic books we find this. Al Muluk at Turk, the Turkish kings. Okay, so now we see that there's a Turkish element on the island as well. That was um, the Latins were initially, we have uh, what they call the, the Crusader kingdoms, and in 1489 it becomes a colony of Venice, although the prior agreement with the Mamluks continues on. Okay, so there's no disruption in the suzerainty of the island. During this time of the Latin rule, however, we need to understand that there's different sects within Christianity. And so in this case, the Latins, Latins are a group of people, the civilization of Catholic Europeans. Right? So the Venetians, obviously, are an Italian people. Prior to that, there was a French-speaking ruling class there. From the Christian perspective at the time, Orthodox were seen very much as heretics not true Christians. And so as a result, orthodoxy was oppressed on the island and the orthodox people as a whole, majority were split into two classes. We have the, the Parigi and the Elefteri. The Parigi are serfs. So every week, is my pronunciation correct there? We have a Greek Cypriot amongst us, so thank you, Master. If I'm pronouncing it correctly. So Parigi is a serf class. So serfdom is where you have to work maybe once, twice, three days a week for your lord. It's a, it's a type of slavery. Okay. Whilst the elefteri means free, free people. But this freedom for the orthodoxy, however, is not at the level of the Latins, God forbid. The elefteri, although they were free, they had to work for their lord on the ground. So they couldn't actually leave the village or that land area. They had to actually work on the ground. So maybe something that we're similar with in Anatolia, the old Aga system, and you had to work for your Aya and, and he had much control over them. This would be that on steroids. Okay. 1517, Sultan Selim I greatly expands the realm of the Ottomans, spreading throughout Syria and into Egypt, and hence he conquers Mamluk Egypt. And along with this conquest comes all the prior agreements that they had with, with the Venetians. It was simply transferred over to the Ottomans. So the island in itself was owned by the Ottomans along with this Mamluk conquest. But they had their autonomy and they were able to govern themselves and they were able to send regular tribute. And this tribute was seen as confirmation of that agreement that you are our subordinates, you own Cyprus essentially, but we are governing it. Governing, governing it. We have uh, 
and we will send you a yearly tribute as well. It does go beyond this as well. Um, we have records that say that Ottoman fleets would actually go and stop over in Cyprus. We have uh, records, primary sources that say that Janissaries camped in Cyprus. Okay. In 1569, there was an Orthodox Cypriot plea for Ottoman rule. So there was two Orthodox Cypriots from the, the Parigi class that took the journey to Istanbul and spoke with the Grand Vizier, Vizier Azam, and said that we've had enough of this Latin rule. We much prefer Turkish rule because we can see that the freedom that they're giving to various classes of people, ethno-religious groups, which they call the millet system, gave them autonomy. And they much preferred that than to be Paregi or Elefteri. Okay. Unfortunately, however, the Grand Vizier of the time did not pass this message on to the Sultan because he was more of a, a pacifist. He was happy with the status quo with the Venetians. The Venetians were a trading kingdom. There was a lot of money involved in being friends with the Venetians and he didn't want to disrupt that. That was one reason. The other reason was that there was a split in the cabinet of the Sultan regarding whether they should go to Cyprus or there was a plea from the Muslims in, in Spain at the time, the last remnants in Granada, who were asking for help. This is our last plea now. If you don't help us now, there's not going to be any Muslims left in uh, Andalusia, in Spain. They had revolted before. The Ottomans sent boats. They sent support. Um, unfortunately, they were unable to create an alliance with the Moroccans. The Moroccans were quite concerned that if they were to ally with the Ottomans, it may endanger their autonomy. It may somewhat bring them into the sphere of influence of the Ottomans. So they weren't happy to negotiate on that front. On that front. So that never happened. And eventually, as we will see, uh, the party that was pushing for the conquest of Cyprus was to win. Okay. Before we get to that, shall, uh, the conquest itself, we need to understand that other than the, the Paregi and the Lefteri, the actual, other than Nicosia and Famagusta, where there was a lot of investment into buildings for the Latins themselves, the Greek Cypriots did not benefit. It was allowed to decay. There was locusts. Um, malaria, all sorts of kind of diseases, and the economy that was being sucked dry and all the was going to the treasury of the Venetians did not benefit the local Greek Orthodox native people at all. Okay. Um, so regarding the the actual boats that uh, went prior to the actual Ottoman conquest, we have the Ruzname of Haidar Chelebi. Um, who mentions that before uh, boats, Ottoman boats were not allowed to camp in Cyprus. However, after the conquest of the Mamluks, this permission was allowed. We have four boats, kayaks, um, which had parked uh, in Cyprus, and tribute was also sent. Prior to the Ottomans coming in preparation for it, we have Nicosia was actually a lot larger. I don't know if any of you have been to Cyprus at all. The famous star-shaped uh, circular um, shape of, of, of Nicosia. Um, that actually is rather towards the end of the Venetian era. Uh, Nicosia itself um, was two-thirds bigger before, um, but the Venetians leveled a lot of that, trying to make Nicosia a lot more compact. They felt that it was going to be a lot better for them in, in, in terms of defense to make it a lot more compact, but in doing so, they actually leveled many churches as well. Some of the churches had kings buried in them, right? So we need to understand this in terms of the, the, the cultural loss that was involved in building up this, this military outpost was quite in, immense. There was also a stream um, that was called Pedicus that went through Nicosia. They diverted that stream as well. So many of you, when you go to, on Cyprus to, to holiday, you, you notice that it's rather dry. Um, again, so the Venetians here have a negative impact on nature within Cyprus as well. Right, so the motivation to gain Cyprus is, is, is multifold. There's many reasons why the Ottomans were persuaded to, to go and, and attack Cyprus. One is religious slash historical ties, the other being geopolitical security, 
repeated contravention of the Ahidname, Ahidname being a, a peace treaty, rejection of the political process, and the fetva, a verdict giving license to proceed. Here we have from a map from the Kitabi Bahriya by Piri Reis, which he create, uh, which he uh, well, this is the Eastern Mediterranean. As you can see, after the Mamluk was conquered, all of this Anatolia, the Levant, Egypt was in the sphere of the Ottoman rule. And you're right in the middle there, Cyprus, which is in Venetian hands. So from a geopolitical standpoint, it was rather dangerous to have in the heart of that land Cyprus, which was in enemy hands. However, this had been the case for some time now. Sultan Selim's son, Sultan Suleiman, the Magnificent, or Kanuni, the lawgiver, he didn't attack Cyprus. He went all the way to Malta as opposed to attacking Cyprus because they had an Ahid Nameh. So as long as the Venetians were playing nice, there was no reason to actually break that treaty. Right? The religious and historical ties I've already mentioned. You had uh, the Arab Byzantine condominium going back as far back as the beginning of Islam. Right? So you have what they call the Sahaba, the Habi'in, the, the companions of the Prophet who were physically in Cyprus. Um Haram bin Timil Han, Muawiyah bin uh, Abi Sufyan, um, and, 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 and many, many more. And some of them have been laid to rest in Cyprus as well. We also have the companions, companions of Tabi'in. And this for Muslims in particular is very significant because the first three generations are praised by, by the Prophet. And so by having them there, that gives a stronger connection to the island as well. Again, this wasn't enough for the Ottomans to actually proceed to try to take that the, the land back into the Muslim fold. It neither was a geopolitical reasoning, as tempting as it was. It was a repeated contravention of the Ahid Nameh. The Ahid Nameh, which continued on the agreement of Cyprus from the Mamluk period, as I mentioned, so from 1517, there was a number of other protocols that were signed, all the way up to 1567. Repeatedly contravened, and how was it contravened? How did they break this uh, this agreement? Was it a one-off, and the Ottomans seized that opportunity to attack Cyprus? Maybe two times, three times. What, what was the case here? Well, they repeatedly contravened the Ahid Name. One, the Venetian navy didn't stop what they call the the Catholic Uskok pirates. These are um, on the Adriatic Sea. It was their agreement. As Catholics, as the power in that region, they were responsible for keeping the peace. These pirates would attack Ottoman sailors and traders. They didn't do anything to stop these pirates. Secondly, encroachment over the frontier in Dalmatia. Okay, they didn't do anything to secure that border with the Ottomans. Again, a repeated offence. Thirdly, captured Muslim corsiers, so Ottoman corsiers, were put straight to death. Whilst the Ahid Nameh stipulates that any courses that are found, Ottoman ones, need to be returned back to Turkey, to Ottoman lands. They would just kill them straight. Okay? But the most important of which and most relevant to this talk is that there was ongoing piracy from the Mamluk time all the way up to the Ottoman capture of those areas. Muslim merchants and Hajj pilgrims would regularly be captured, enslaved, their goods and products would be stolen from them. And when the Venetians were asked about this, they said, oh, it's not our fault. They're Maltese pirates or Messenian pirates, but they're on your land. They're, on, they're coming from Cyprus, attacking small boats, large boats, it doesn't matter. So you can think about the, the scale in which this operation was running. So the Ottomans were rather patient, actually. They didn't just seize the first opportunity to attack Cyprus, although it was a sweet idea for them, going back to historical ties, geopolitical security. According to Mustafa Fendi Selaniki, in his book Tarihi Selaniki, and he died in 1600, so he's a contemporary source, he mentions, and I'll read a translation for you, the Padishah of this place and time, His Majesty Sultan Selim Khan, whilst he was a prince, he sent some men to the land of Egypt, for he wanted sugar, rice, horses, and some gifts. The men became caught in a storm, and when they survived the sea, the cursed 
faithless and irreligious while still in the agreement of peace, they stole their horses and purchased the goods. It belongs to the prince, as is known. They say, after inflicting treachery, certainly imperial revenge will be taken. So, mockingly, they were saying that it belongs to the prince. They were aware that it belonged to the, the Shehzade Selim of the time. It didn't matter to them. They must have contravened the treaty so many times, they probably thought the Ottomans won't do anything. So what did the Ottomans do? They decided, let's go through a political process. If we attack Cyprus, there's going to be much bloodshed for the Turks and the Catholics. So they sent emissaries. They sent Mahmoud Chavush in 1569, and he explained to them that the Ottomans have set their sight on Cyprus. They're coming. Let's come up with a peace of agreement where we can hand over Cyprus and we can continue on with our friendship. Right? We can continue as good allies. He said, Cyprus is so far. Venetia, Venetia is somewhere around here. Whilst the Ottoman lands are here. What are you going to do with Cyprus? What good is it to you? It fell on deaf ears. March 1570. A few months before the start of the campaign. Again the Ottomans tried the peaceful route. They sent this time Kubat Chavush. And this time he was more forceful. He said, either you give Cyprus to us or we'll take it by force. Again it fell on deaf ears. Once they went through all of these reasonings, the Sultan, you see, he's not a king, right? He's a caliph. So there is a constitution in place, in this case, a theoroxy, right? So they have to go through the process. As much as the boxes that they've ticked, they need to get the license, a fetva, a verdict, before the Sultan can actually proceed. And they questioned the, the grand mufti of the time, the Sheikh al-Islam, Ebu Su'ud Efendi. And they asked him, a land that was pri previously in the abode of Islam, that now has become a place of much concern, of much troublemaking. What can we do? Can we proceed to attack? And he confirmed. Of course you can. You, it's in your right to do so. It's not in the advantage of the Ottoman state to leave things as they are, regardless of how well the trade is going between Venetia and the Ottomans. And only, and only once he received that fetva were they able to proceed. Uh, guys, if you think there's a lot of religious language being used, it's not because this is a religious lecture. just want to highlight. But it was, we need to understand that it might sound a bit strange for us in 2023 in the UK, thinking back to those times. But in those times, everything was run by religion. So the Venetian symbol was the, the, the line of St. Mark. Right? So Catholicism was a very important part that played for them. And similarly for the Ottomans. For them, being an Islamic empire, I mean everything, it was either you're Muslim or guided Muslim, and Muslim or non-Muslim. So for them, things that were of the importance to protecting Muslim people was their responsibility as, 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 as the owners of the caliphate. Okay. Okay. So, preparation for the provisions prior to the actual campaign starting. And this was very much predominantly an Anatolian and Rumelian campaign. So the, the resources, the manpower predominantly came from those areas. Some areas such as Syria and also Egypt also contributed, but predominantly it was an Anatolian and, and a Rumelian a Balkan campaign. And from March to April of 1570, extensive logistical preparations were made. Orders were were issued to procure provisions such as bread, grain, wood, honey, oil, rice, cheese, and yogurt from various regions. So it tells us a bit about the diet of the time as well. Uh, officials were tasked with collecting supplies and ensuring they were ready for soldiers departing from different locations, including Teke in Anatolia, Egypt, and Aleppo. Aleppo is a very interesting one, currently in modern-day Syria. Halep in Turkish and Arabic. But it's also well recorded in Ottoman sources, Halebi Turkmen because of the sheer number of Turkmen's that were found in Halep at the time. So we mustn't think of things in binary. Syria, Arab, Anatolia, Turk, Balkan, Greek, and so on. These are, the, these are modern day divisions. Right? Uh, specific instructions were given to send janissaries and gunpowder from Egypt, 
as well as gunpowder and military personnel from Aleppo again to Cyprus. These efforts highlight the careful planning and coordination involved in preparing for the campaign. Prayers were said. So I'm just going to read that for you now, just to kind of understand the culture and the mindset of the people of the time. A message was sent to various different vilayets, provinces, to recite the following uh, prayer for the army. The victorious army that has been sent to the island of Cyprus, so they may be worthy of admiration, victorious and successful, and that their miserable transgressors be defeated and become despicable. And may God Almighty in his grace facilitate the conquest of the island. In the lodge of the exalted, all bountiful, the one who has no entreaty to make, and who is the opener, the knowing, the remedy finder, to in complete humility and modesty in the honoured mosques and in the grand places for assembly, on the days of Thursday and Monday, in the blessed times, that the righteous scholars and the pious nobles and the Muslim community and the believers to recite from the honourable Enam and the chapter of Fat. A beneficial prayer for preservance. These are these are chapters from the Quran. Okay, so the campaign begins. The Sultan he appoints Lala Mustafa Pasha, who was a vizier um, of Bosnian Bosniak extract, actually, uh, as a Serdar, the Grand Commander, to, to campaign for Cyprus. He was in, in charge of the land forces. Various governors and officials from Anatolia were assigned to join the campaign. Piale Pasha was tasked with protecting the sea route with a fleet of ships and in May 19, sorry, 1570, Captain Ali Pasha led the fleet from Beşiktaş towards Cyprus with the Sultan escorting them up to Yedikule. They waited at Finike, which is southern Anatolia, so, uh, southwest Anatolia, uh, waiting for all the Anatolian troops to gather at Finike. And Piale Pasha ensured safe passage for Ottoman soldiers and obstructed non-Muslim support for the Venetians. The Catholic world at this time was thinking about making an alliance. They stop and halt these Ottomans. So there was very much a continent and alliance being formed. So there was a rush to start the campaign as soon as possible. Now the landing, there's, if you go onto the internet, there'll be various sources. Some say that they came to Lemaso, some say Larbaka. Um, however, if we go back to old Venetian sources from the time, they said that there was a place called Lara, which is in Paphos. Um, in the western part towards the shore, and that was actually attacked first, unsuccessfully, unfortunately, for the Ottomans. So they withdrew. That was more of a, a tester. Then they actually started their campaign and they went to the southern port town of Limassol, where the combined Ottoman fleet eventually embarked on Finike. They passed Paphos, Paf, and they went to Limassol on the bottom. They captured the Kolossi Castle, Kolosh in Turkish, uh, meeting little resistance, the Ottomans easily occupied the areas between Episkopi, Episkopul, all the way north up to Polimitia. Okay, so all that southern area of Limassol was easily taken. Why was it easily taken? Because there wasn't Venetian forces. The Orthodox there were rather happy actually in the change of power, so they didn't meet. They met little resistance at Limassol. Similarly, at Larnaca, 24th of July 1570, they landed at Larnaca, known commonly by the Turks as Tuzla, and they decided to seize Nicosia. Piale Pasha was more uh, in line of attacking Famagusta after. However, Lala Mustafa Pasha, being the head of the land forces, said, no, we're going to go to Nicosia. Before that, however, they took an incursion and went and tried to go towards Lefkara, which is kind of slightly west towards from Larnaca, very close to Larnaca. And in, in Lefkara, very interestingly, the Ottomans were not that well aware of how to get there. So a monk, sorry, a Greek Cypriot Orthodox priest went, met the Ottoman troops as they come this way, and he led them to Lefkara. And there they met no resistance at all. The people submitted, we're happy with this change. Now, unfortunately, however, Angelo Calepio, a monk from Nicosia, he was there, he's, he's, a, he's a contemporary source. He actually records, without actually holding back, which is quite surprising, the following. The enemy, the Ottomans, meanwhile made various raids and reached Lefkara, guided by a Greek priest of the village. The government was promptly informed and Captain Meaduka Dimitri Laskari, 
with his company of light horse, were sent with orders to give the village to fire and flame and kill old and young. So all the villagers, the Greek Orthodox people of that village, old, young, male, female, finished in one go. They eventually went towards the Ottoman troops, but their strength and bravery may work may have worked for the old and the and and uh, the feeble of the village, but it was no match for the troops, and they went scuttling back to Nicosia. Then, from there, the Ottomans decided it's time for us to go to Nicosia. This is a map of Nicosia with the new fortification. This star-shaped area is Sularici, within the, the borders of the old town of Nicosia. This is actually a map of the siege of Nicosia by Giovanni Camocchio, 1574. You can see all the, the Ottoman troops surrounding this area. Famagusta is towards this side, and there were some troops there to ensure that there would be no support coming in from Famagusta to Nicosia. The defence was led by Lieutenant Dandolo, who is said to have been inexperienced. A request for peaceful submission was rejected. Again, the Ottomans, this is part of their tradition. When they go to war, you first give them the option. Resist, submit, and all your, your livelihood, your properties, and the people will be secured. We will ensure your security. The alternative is that we can go and take uh, booty and, and slaves, as was the case. All empires did this at the time. So without trying to justify it, Christians, Muslims, everybody was doing it. The only difference is that this option here was given that do you submit peacefully, whilst others didn't do this. So Captain Ali Pasha, being courageous and senior, was appointed to besiege the fortified capital of Nicosia, the base of Kirshehir and Akshehir, and central Anatolia, uh, arrived first with their tents with the Venetians initiating an attack. The Bele Bay of Karaman, Hassan Pasha, reached the battleground in time to support upon the Venetian army, fled back to their fortress. The next day arrived the famed Serdar Mustafa Pasha with his great army. On the same day, they immediately began preparing trenches. Trenches around. Okay. They brought their Janissaries along one side. They had Sipahis on the other side as well. Various divisions of Ottoman soldiers. We had Iskander Pasha, Captain Ali Pasha, Aleppo, Dervish Pasha, along with the commanders of Rumelia, the Balkans, and Muzaffar Pasha, Hassan Pasha. Artillery was placed on all sides of the fortified walls. Now, some people say there may have been 60,000 in the Ottoman troops. Uh, some push it to 80,000. It's really difficult to know the exact number, because unlike the, the Latin sources where they give you a total number, Ottomans would give you specific Sipahis was this much, Janissaries was this much, and as they were losing men, there was more coming from Anatolia and Romelia. So it's hard to tell the exact number, but we can somewhat estimate it to about 60 to 80,000 based on witness accounts. The 15th of August, 1570, the siege of Nicosia began in the time of Dhuhr, early namaz, the afternoon prayer. The Venetian army left the fortress and went to attack the Karamanid soldiers, Karaman being the southern Anatolian soldiers, who were very well prepared and fought hard, killing and capturing many of their opponents with the remainder fleeing back to the fortress. Every day from early morning to late evening, the Janissary riflemen would continually fire from their positions, which the Venetians could not rise against. Eventually, when the Ottomans broke, started breaking into the bastions, each of these, holes were starting to be made. And they kind of, in a, in a mocking fashion, they sent a donkey. They, they sent a donkey through the hole. They said, don't hurt the donkey, it can do you no harm. And then they followed up, once they got their attention, surrender, for you are in a bad way. So again, they're trying to surrender, let's just stop the bloodshed. But they were rather stubborn. And so, the 9th of September 1570, the courageous Anatolian and Karamanid forces enter the fortress from the east inside. From the Constanza Bastion, this, each of these bastions, these points here, have a name. And so the Constanza Bastion is here which is currently in the southern side of Nicosia, in the Republic of Cyprus. There, a Turkish soldier laid the Ottoman flag, and he was martyred on that spot. 
And that is the same spot in which we have the Bayrak Darjani in southern Cyprus, which is open to this day. Okay, so it, it's very similar to the tale of the conquest of Istanbul, where you have Ulu Batl Hasan, who had planted the flag and then he was shot with arrows and he was martyred on that spot. So this is the Cypriot Ulu Batl Hasan, but we don't know his name. Okay, and we can, you can go there now to this bastion, to the Bayrak Darjami. Bayrak Darjami means flag bearer, mind you. And his tomb is still there. The battle ensued in the streets of Nicosia. If you go to Nicosia now, you can see tombs everywhere on the streets. You're walking around, there's tombs, Ottoman tombs, Janissary tombs, everywhere. Because there were street battles. People were fighting on the street. That last kind of fight there was a capital of, uh, capital of Cyprus, after all. The other soldiers of Islam entered Nicosia from breaches on other corners of the fortresses, killing and capturing the enemy. Their commanders withdrew into the palace. But very interestingly, so the palace was... Uh, if you're familiar, within the centre of Nicosia, you have what they call Sarayonu Meidana, because there used to be a palace there. Okay. And on the palace itself, a Greek Cypriot took down the Venetian flag and he put up the Ottoman flag in its place. Okay. Now, the Venetian sources are the ones who tell us this. What they say is that he was drunk. But if you're drunk, where would have you got the Ottoman flag from? You just started sowing it whilst there was war going on? So it shows that he must have corresponded with the Ottoman army. He got the flag to give them the motivation. Look, we've captured this place now. Right? So this campaign should not be thought as of an exclusively a Turkish campaign. We have, as we said, Anatolian Turks, Rumelian Turks. We have uh, Middle East and Egyptian uh, from Syria and the Greek Cypriots themselves who were supporting, much to their detriment. But they, weren't, they didn't give up. They wanted Turkish rule. Or should we say Ottoman rule? 15th of September, 1570, Mustafa Pasha went to the Hagia Sophia. They succeeded in capturing the capital of Nicosia. And the Hagia Sophia, yeah, same name as the one in Istanbul. Yeah. In the 1950s or so, they changed the name to Selimiye. But in all the Ottoman sources, this, this cathedral, which would be changed into a mosque, was always called the Hagia Sophia Giants. Okay. And there, uh, Lala Mustafa Pasha said his first prayer. And he donated waqf. He gave waqf uh, a sword and a Qur'an. What's the significance of a sword? That it was not through submission which they got Nicosia. It was through the sword. Just like Istanbul. So if you go see now, there was this huge controversy when Hagia Sophia became uh, a mosque again. And the imam comes in and he's got a sword in his hand. Hey, what's this very fine? It's symbolic. It was Ottoman culture. Any city that was conquered by the sword... The main mosque, Jami, Jami Kebir, the Grand Mosque, would have a sword there to symbolize that, this area. Uh, that sword was used every Friday in the Hagia Sophia, up until it was stolen in the 20th century. So, I'm very unfortunate regarding that. Okay, now, Don Dolo, the commander of Nicosia, was rather, but he didn't want to submit. So what happened to him? And his commanders, their heads were cut off. Much like the Venetians did at Lara, by the way. They cut off the, the Turkish soldiers' heads and took it to Nicosia. This is common practice. Um, but those heads actually saved lives because they brought it to Carinia and Paphos. And they requested the Itaat Ahali Girnie Vebaf. Itaat means submission. So this is Ottoman Turkish. This isn't Arabic, by the way. Okay, so they submitted the submission of the people of Girne, which is called Girne today in Turkish, Karinya. There, Paf, Paphos. Okay, and having seen this, they accepted. So although there were castles in both Paphos and Karinya, they said, actually, we don't want to fight. We quite, we rather like where our heads are at the moment. Um, so actually, we, we'll just sign the, the, the peace treaty, and, and no one was hurt. No swords in the churches or anything like this, right? And actually, the the commanders of both of these towns and the major towns, mind you, were given kaftans, which was at that time a great honor. It was a status. These people were honored because they actually submitted and there wasn't bloodshed. Okay, everyone knows what a kaftan is. Yeah, long Ottoman coat. Okay. okay. So just to recap, this is a map of Cyprus. Yeah. 
Silifke is round here, very close, they went round, and they had an expeditionary uh, attack at Lara, which wasn't successful, and many of the Turks who were captured, their heads were cut off by the Venetians, and it was brought to Nicosia, Lefkosia. This is the Ottoman Turkish names, by the way, next to it. I think it's very important, uh, as a side note, I'm just going to do a little tangent, but it's very important to always refer back to the Ottoman Turkish, otherwise anyone can say anything, right? So we always have to go back and refer back to these sources. If we can't read Ottoman Turkish, then we should refer back to people who can, otherwise we don't know what's happening. Are we learning our history from the West? How much can the West be trusted? Right? What's happening nowadays in, in, in media? If there was no social media, we would have thought that there's 40 babies that have been decapitated, right? So it's always good to go back to the sources and look at both sides, and hence why this presentation is about the Venetian and the Ottoman sources. So the Ottoman heads were cut off and taken to Nicosia, Lefkosia. So the boat went, and then the main forces then came from Silifke, went down past Buff, Paphos, and then Piale Pasha, the head of the navy, went to Limassol, and Lala Mustafa Pasha camped at Larnaca. From Larnaca, they went to Lefkara, where the priest showed them the way, and the people accepted Ottoman rule, and they were all killed by the Venetians. From there, they went to Nicosia. From Nicosia, after they had the, the bloody battle and captured that capital city, then we have the peaceful submission of both Carinia and Paphos. The only place that was holding out now was from Augusta, Mosa, and Mojostos. And that takes us to the siege of Famagusta, which the whole island was taken in 1570. Each of those towns had governors, had bays. So Ottoman rule was consolidated on the island, except for Famagusta. And here we have a Venetian first-hand account drawing of Famagusta during the time. So we see Ottoman ships here. We can see here Ottoman soldiers and the fortification of Famagusta. In typical Ottoman style, there's the 2D kind of miniatures that are drawn. This is from the siege of Famagusta. This is from Shahname Selimhan. It's a Ottoman Turkish tradition to write about each Sultan and their achievements with, with miniature drawings and accounts of those details. So these are all first-hand drawings of those times. The request for peaceful submission was given. Unfortunately, there was a stubborn commander called Mark Antonio Bragadin. And he was hoping that the Christian forces, remember I mentioned about the allies that were building up in the Mediterranean. He was hoping that they would come. Unfortunately for Bragadin, once they were on their way coming, close to Crete, the news came to them that Nicosia had fallen. So they went back. And thought it's not worth it just to say Famagusta. It's too much effort. In a sea, in an Ottoman sea, in the Levant, not worth it. So they went back. The siege of Famagusta, however, went from September 1570 up until August 1571. So he held out for a very long time and it was a very bloody battle. Was it worth it? I mean, usually not in these cases, but it's war. So the peaceful submission was rejected and so Lala Mustafa Pasha with his troops, went and besieged the fortress of Famagusta. A combined Christian fleet of 200 vessels, I mentioned, um, turned back. Piale Pasha and his navy raided the Venetian territory of Crete to make sure that there wasn't going to be any Cretan boats coming at all. And on the land, the Ottomans built deep trenches around, cutting around to the fortress. It fell bang in the middle of winter, and so they had to prepare some more provisions from the mainland and also troops. So one of the other myths actually that I hear is the initial settlers in Cyprus, the Turkish settlers, were from the Ottoman troops. They said, aha, Janissaries, they were from Christian stock. Well, yes and no, but the Janissaries were not the only, people, the only troops that went to Cyprus. They had Sipahis and such, and reinforcements were actually called from Tatars and Yoduks as well. So Yoduk tribes from Nalduken, Vize, Tangrida, 
Osman from Bursa, minus from Sivas and Tokat, and Lamju minus from Ruha, were summoned to support the campaign. No one ever mentioned the Yuruks. It's always the Janissaries, Christian, uh, Islamicized Christian boys. Right? Where's the nuance? Because we're getting our history from the West, that's, what, that's the problem. Right? No one mentions the Yuruks. It's inconvenient for them to mention that. Also, there were uh, the Subashu of the Kojajuk Yuruk community was ordered to send troops within six months and food supplies as well. And this was to be collected from the Boaz Hisara in Istanbul and transported to Cyprus. In addition, military personnel, logistical preparations were made to support the campaign. Jan Bolat, Bey of Azaz and Kilis, uh, was ordered to send Kavaz soldiers. Yeah, Kavaz is still a surname used in Cyprus, actually. With firewood from the Sanjak of Uzair, were prepared and dispatched. This, these meticulous preparations underscore the Ottoman state commitment to bolstering its forces and ensure the success of the Cyprus campaign. We're very fortunate. The Ottomans were very meticulous in their record keeping. So you know, how much wood was taken, how much cheese was taken, where it was taken from, who was responsible for it, all of that is recorded. Which tribes came to Cyprus, eventually which people settled in Cyprus, we know exactly who they were, who our descendants were. Right, it's clear. Okay. Unfortunately, heedlessness led to a bit of a setback. There were many tribes that were called, and for example, I mentioned some of the Yoruks, only some of, the, some of them came. Others didn't come, some of them needed more encouragement. There were some troops in Cyprus who actually left, went back to, into Anatolia. So an order was made, those who had left without a legitimate reason, their lands would be taken off from them. Okay, so that was part of the military service. Um, enemy ships had left from Crete, but roads failed to send reinforcements promptly. Um, 17th of February, uh, 1571, repairs were ordered for weapons and boats and roads. Enemy ships carrying soldiers reached Famagusta, not that alliance one. Um, despite orders to halt them, and troops were recruited and gunpowder were ordered for the Nicosia campaign, as mentioned. 15th of March 1571, preparations were made to defend Nicosia and newly acquired territories, so the fortresses and such were strengthened, so that there was no chance of the Venetians taking any of it back. Uh, again, prayers were said for the Ottoman victory, uh, that was requested in Damascus and Aleppo, Halebi Turkmen. Uh, additional orders for supplies and reinforcements were dispatched on 22nd and 25th of March. The conquest, however, was soon to come. In April 1571, Pertev Pasha was appointed to lead the Ottoman navy as anticipated further re enemy reinforcements. On the 31st of July, Ottoman troops launched a final assault from all fronts. All the fronts. Leaving the Venetians in despair, facing defeat and lacking outside support, the Venetians surrendered agreeing to relinquish control of Famagusta and return Muslim captives. So there's actually 50 Muslim captives, if you recall, that there were enslaved Hajj pilgrims and Muslim merchants who were captured. There was 50 of them still in Famagusta who were captured. So it's okay. On 1st of August, they flew the white flag. And so peace negotiations started. And so, they said, okay, we can give you peace. We'll give you our boats, the Ottoman said, and take you to the nearest safe lands. And you give us the 50... Muslim captives back. Okay, that's fine. So they ultimately conquered Famagusta, but a tragic incident occurred when a galleon exploded, resulting in significant casualties. However, and there's always a however in this campaign, the Venetians failed to fulfill their promises. These Venetians never learned their lesson. A conversation between Lala Musa Pasha and the Venetian commander Mark Antonio Bragadin is as follows. So I'll read the Ottoman Turkish first. I'm sure many of you will be able to make out uh, what it says. I'll give the translation after as well, just so that we know that we're going from original sources. So Lala Mustafa Pasha asks Mark Antonio, Bu kadar gemi ki size verildi, deryada donanmanız var. Gemilerin izine bize vasıl olunca rehin tarıkıyla bir bey kalsın. Bey değil, kelb alık olmasın. Kelb means dog, köpek. Ya ol eserayı Müslümin kanı Onlar cümlesi benim değil idi. Her biri beylerden ve asker halklarından birinin idi. Dire gecesi katıl etmişler. Dire means peace treaty. Dire gecesi in the night of the peace treaty katıl etmişler. Ya sende olanı neyledin? So what did you do with the ones that were with you? 
onları katıl edecek. Ben dahi katıl ettim. Şimdi bu takdirce vireyi sen bozmuşsun. So, saying, so many ships have been given to you when our galleys in the sea meet as a security. Leave one of your commanders here. You will not get a dog back, let alone a commander. So what about the blood of the Muslim captives? They were not all with me. They were distributed among my commanders and soldiers. They were killed on the night of our agreement. So what did you do with the ones with you? When the others were killed, I then also killed the ones with me. Now, in this regard, you have broken our agreement. Okay, so the, prior to that, if they had agreed in a peaceful way, they would have been able to go. Their properties and everything would have been able to be theirs. No problem. So this earned the anger of Lala Mustafa Pasha. So he killed the ten commanders who had killed their Muslim captives. And Mark Antonio, being the leader of them, was told to move aside. They're going to research exactly how were these captives killed. Okay, and that's an important part now. How were these Muslim captives killed? They contravened the Aman Name peace peace treaty. Okay. So they decapitated the ten commanders in front of the tent. Bragadin was sent. When they investigated, they brought him back. And they heard that the Muslims were tortured to death. Okay, and the way would be described soon. I won't give too much detail, but just some so you get an idea of what kind of torture the, the, these innocent Muslim pilgrims and merchants have to face. Mustafa wanted to give the same punishment, the same torture, to Bragadin as they had given to the Muslims. So what he did, he cut his ear off. And he cut his nose off. And then he skinned them alive. The exact same thing that they had done to the Muslims. Fifty of them. Okay. They tortured the Muslims in the same way. But unfortunately for hundreds and hundreds of years, we are hearing about Marco, Marc Antonio Bragadin. He's made into like a secular martyr in the western world and the Ottomans are seen to be in a bad fashion okay so one Marco Bra Bragadino is worth more than 50 Muslims and nothing's changed this day has it someone throws a stone it's okay you can bomb the whole town children, adults, doesn't matter it's the same culture okay. and this is an image from the time from the uh, Shahname Selim Selim Han the Turks then, whilst all this was happening, went inside the Latin Cathedral of St. Nicholas, which is also called Hagia Sophia, which is called the Lala Mustafa Pasha Mosque now. And they adorned the mosque with a pulpit, a minbar, a prayer niche, and a mihrab, and they played, prayed the Friday prayer. During which time, Bragadin was made to carry the soil from the trench in the same fashion as he had made the Turks do, the captured captives. And he said to Mustafa Pasha, prior to the peace agreement, you will remove your back with your back, the soil which you have filled the trenches with. So he was made to do the same thing. Okay. And we get these records from an individual called Ali Efendi, who was actually present there at the time. Now, just for some nuance, the Ottomans were in kind of two camps about this. Not all of them agreed with what Allah Mustafa Pasha did. They all understood the motive. They were all disgusted with Mar what Marco Antonio did. But some of them said, he shouldn't have tortured him in the same way that he tortured the Muslims. So there was a bit of nuance there in terms of what the, the thoughts were regarding that. Regardless, the contemporary history of that the historian of time, Mustafa Ali, describes Bragadin as Kelbi Kebiri Akur, the great rabid dog. Whilst in Europeans, and unfortunately was infiltrated into Turkish sources now, because we've been cut off from our old Ottoman sources, we are also repeating that Lala Mustafa Pasha broke a treaty and this was a case where where's the new ones? 50 Muslims dead. And to conclude, Fetih Nameler, Fetih Name, letters of conquest were sent to all the different provinces. And with that, I'd like to thank you. This is the, the start of the Turks, the time of the Turks of Cyprus, the Muslims of Cyprus, what leads up to 1878, 1960s. And 1974 to the Turkish Republic of Northern Cyprus this is where the history stems from. I thank you for your time and I welcome any questions.